the Powerful Content Podcast, your go-to source for content creation, strategy, and business inspiration. I'm your host, Mel Daniels, content strategist, coach, and speaker, empowering women across the globe to grow their business with powerful content that connects, nurtures, and converts. So if you're ready to create standout content that gets you noticed and remembered or build an aligned audience who love you and are ready to buy from you, you're in the right place. I believe that content has the power to connect us all. It's up to you how you use it. Listen in for genuine and insightful chats with guests, as well as practical tools and strategies from me. It's so lovely to have you here. Let's dive into the show. I acknowledge the Wongal people of the Eora Nation as the traditional custodians of the country that I am recording from today. I recognise their continuing connection to the land and waters. I pay my respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to all First Nation people listening today. Hello, hello, beautiful people, and welcome to episode 111 of the Powerful Content Podcast. Today, I have with me the amazing Julia Scott. So Julia is an intuitive money mindset and finance expert with many years of experience as a chartered accountant tax advisor and wealth management specialist. Julia is also certified in money mindset and feng shui. This is her unique point of difference. Her passion for female financial empowerment led her to address the gaps in the market for female sensitive financial education and advice. Julia helps women all over the world let go of money blocks so that they can earn more, scale their business and build lasting wealth. Welcome to the podcast, Julia. Thank you for having me, Mel. It's a pleasure to be here. It's such an interesting mix of experience as well as qualifications that you have. And I'm really interested to know, Julia, how did you get to this place of combining such interesting aspects of money and wealth? Yeah, well, I think to tell you the truth, I never wanted to be an accountant. (laughs) That was my dad's idea. I'm more right brain, more creative. But my dad was like, he's a businessman and he's like, everyone needs an accountant and he needed an accountant in the family as well. So I ended up going to uni doing like economics and commerce. And then I came out, became a chartered accountant, became a tax agent, became a financial advisor, just did the path, Mm -hmm. did quite well. But I always felt different because I wasn't that left brain analytical kind of person. And it it served me well because I was more of the front of house, like the customers, the clients would, would like me because I could communicate effectively complicated financial concepts in a way that they could understand because I was thinking the same way as them, if that makes sense. But then what happened was I took time out to have children. I got, ended up getting divorced. No one necessarily sees that coming. I certainly didn't. And I realized I'd left all of our finances up to my husband who was in the same profession as me, but it's, it's notoriously well known out there that just like builders, houses are never finished. A lot of financial advisors personal finances are not that great because we're too busy doing it for other people and you know we don't like to do it for ourselves so when we got divorced I had to manage my own money for the first time in quite a while and make my own decisions and I was used to doing that for other people really quite easily I I was advising some of the wealthiest families in the country on their portfolios but when it came to my own I felt like just blocked. And I knew what I had to do, but it was like I was sabotaging and I just couldn't seem to do the things I needed to do to get to buy, to put the portfolio together, so to speak. And that's when I realized it's not about what you know with money. It's about what you believe is possible to you. And I, at that stage, was in a quite a bad place coming out of a divorce as most people are it's very emotional time and especially as a woman and that's when I came across things like feng shui and mindset because I was pulling myself out of this deep depression so to speak and I had to get it together so these were the tools that I used and then I started looking into the concept of women and money the history of women and money and how we really haven't been doing money for that long it was only in 1984 that the sexual discrimination act came into play in Australia and up until then 
a bank could just say no for a female applying for a credit card without a male co-signer, even if she was a breadwinner. Like, that's not that long ago. It's no wonder we we feel like we're not great at money. I think a lot of women, there's been studies done on this, a lot of women have less financial confidence than men, but it's not anything to do with our intelligence. We're just as intelligent as men and there's nothing against men either. It's just this social conditioning that we have that still occurs today in like little children you know you see boys are sort of encouraged to be boisterous so to speak and speak their mind and and challenge things and little girls are sort of taught to play quietly and be nice to people so all of that stuff unfortunately still plays out all of the time and most of the time we don't realize that it's subconscious because by definition a subconscious belief we don't question it. We believe it to be true. So this is what I help women with to understand that it's, first of all, it's not their fault. It's this social conditioning if they're not feeling comfortable making financial decisions. Second of all, it was learned and it can be unlearned. And then finally, to address what their money blocks are, to help them to just let go of that resistance around making financial decisions and just make them with ease and just so much quicker and then you have so much more energy and to put into your income producing kind of ideas and things like that instead of worrying using all this mind energy and decision making capacity on over analyzing things and worrying about things too much because it's just a waste Hmm. such an interesting concept and I'm just going to pick up on something that you said Julia that just really really resonated with me and I know that it would resonate with my listeners as well and it's probably something that we do need to talk about more and it's not what you know about money it's what you believe about money and like you said it's all of those subconscious beliefs the things that have been you know ingrained in us from a very young age whether our parents meant it whether you know the people around us meant to put those beliefs into our head but it's just things that we have grown up with and learnt along the way and then they manifest in in what we do every single day so I really love that and if anyone is listening to this podcast that's I think the one thing that I would love for people to walk away with today that it's not what you know we're all smart we're smart people we know how to do things it's what you believe about the money and I know that we're going to dive into that a little bit further in a second I feel like it's really interesting Julia as well to come across someone like you who has this amazing combination of skills and experience so some might call it like the fluffy side so (laughs) it's not really but some people might call it that or the woo-woo side in terms of the mindset and the intuitive side of things really combined with something that's so fact driven. So, you know, you were a finance expert and you have all of these qualifications in that finance field. You did mention how you came to the Feng Shui and the mindset side of things after your divorce. But how do you think that combining those two things does make you unique in this space? Well, I think this is the whole missing link and I don't know why we haven't been talking about it in finance land. It's like comparing it to, you know, the medical profession and ignoring the mind body connection. Like we all know now it's scientifically proven that your thoughts create your reality. And if you're feeling anxious or, you know, you'll sweat and your body will have a physical response. And it's the same with, with money. Like when you're feeling stressed about things, your IQ literally almost halves right when you're really stressed about money and you cannot make good financial decisions because your judgment is clouded so it's so important to me to help women understand there's so much you can do to clear your head so that you can think clearly so you can let go of the stress you can set up your surroundings better with the feng shui side of things it's all about the flow of energy and how your surroundings are a mirror for what's going on inside of your head so if you you know just for example if you've got a really messy space like think about if you've got a teenager your teenager's bedroom is usually a mess right and you can complain all you like but there it's always going to be a mess because this is a reflection of the stage of life they're in in their mind and in their body they're going through massive change they're turning from a child into a young adult so there is a lot of confusion there is and that is manifested in this personal space right so you can you know for ourselves as grown-ups you can make sure your space if you're feeling conflicted about your family you can make sure your space doesn't necessarily have your kids drawings everywhere and stuff there's nothing wrong with 
you know, having one or two, but having that overwhelming in your space is going to make you feel guilty constantly. And this is that energy drain that we were talking about where all your energy for decision-making and ideas is going into this stress and guilt of, I should be with my kids right now. And then when you're with your kids, you, you think you should be at work, you know? And so it's a, it's a never ending cycle of downward spiral. So you can set yourself up for success in your surroundings. You can set yourself up for success with your mindset and the thoughts that you say to yourself. You can set yourself up for financial success with setting financial goals and making sure that they are more than enough. Because if they're, not, if they're only just enough, what, where is this coming from? What, what does that say about you that you think you're only allowed to have just enough? Like there's no goal police. <laughs> Why do we do that? <laughs> All of this stuff is so important. And then to me, the actual finance part, the numbers is just so small. Like it's like 20%, it's 80% mindset and surroundings and 20% about your, your mindset. And, you know, if it was all about knowledge, librarians would be billionaires because they're surrounded by knowledge and they get to read it every day. Like, you know, university professors, they're not really renowned for being massively wealthy. They're usually so engrossed in their work because it's not about knowledge. It's got nothing to do with knowledge. It's got to do with your belief system about what you think is possible for you, whether you've seen it happen with other people nearby to you that have the same kind of circumstances. Maybe you're stuck feeling like my family has always struggled with money and so that's going to be my struggle as well. And it's a belief. So you probably don't even question it. You're just like, that's just the way it is. Money's always hard for me. I don't get money. It's really hard. Stop. Stop saying that straight away. <laughs> because of course it's not true. Anyone can be good at money. Mm. I love that. I love that idea. Can we just dive into a couple of things here, Julia? So you said that wealth is around or, you know, managing your money is around managing your surroundings and your mindset. And that's about 80%. And then your numbers is about 20%. So can we just talk about the surroundings for a second? You, you talked to just briefly about having children's pictures up and how that could, you know, create conflict in terms of whether you want to be with your family when you want to yeah. actually be working. Yeah, so yeah. what kind of practical tips could you give someone in terms of their surroundings? Well, the biggest thing you can do is to declutter and make sure everything is clear of bits of paper. And so because every piece of paper you have lying around is a delayed decision. And your subconscious knows that. Your peripheral vision, you will see it everywhere. And even if it's away in cupboards, you know in the back of your head that it's waiting for you, right? And so this sort of keeps on feeding that whole idea that I never have enough time to do anything. Everything's, I'm always behind on things. So if you can just declutter everything and get as organized as possible in terms of even your digital decluttering, emails, text messages, I've done events before, speaking events, and we've asked everyone to look at their unread emails. And, you know, there'll be anywhere from like a thousand unread emails. And someone had a hundred thousand unread emails in the last event I did. And I'm like, and you don't think that's affecting you? Every time you look at that screen and there's that hundred thousand on the icon, subconsciously that's affecting you. It's stressing you, mm -hmm. even though you've decided to delay it you know it's waiting for you. So you either set up a system so that all the stuff that you don't need to read is automatically marked as read and filed away to where you need it to go or you unsubscribe to things and, and you just set up more systems and it's the same with money. Everything, there's so many ways to put systems in place and it's really not very hard. You know how to do this if you really think about it. It's not hard. Mm -hmm. Why are we not doing it? It's like when you want to get fit you know you need to go to the gym. You need to go to the gym for at least four days a week. And if you do that for two months, you can't not get fit. You will be fit. It's a, it's a fact, right? You can't not. If you're doing it right, you, can, you can't not. It's the same with money. We know we have to spend less than we earn. We know we need to have a plan. We know we need to, you know, set goals that have a stretch and have meaning to them, but we don't. So it's subconscious. It's got nothing to do with not knowing what to do. You know what to do. That, that's, that's really, really interesting. And I'm going to have to ask you a question here, Julia. 
when you just said you know what you need to do so you know you know you need to spend less than what you earn you know that you need to make a plan what if people have partners in their life who are not on board with this so there is a conflict and perhaps they personally do want to really look at their money mindset and the way that they are creating wealth but there is someone else that may be blocking that or blocking the energy this is another big problem for women is this whole need to please and make other people feel comfortable all the time you're not responsible for the other person even if you're in a relationship like you can guide them as much as you like but you cannot change anything outside of you all you can change is in is in here in yourself and by you changing and you elevating in that department your example will be seen by your partner and they'll be like noticing it. And they're like, how did you do that? I want to do that too. So that's one way. The next way is I have this free quiz on my website to learn your money personality, your money patterns that are unique to you. So you can get yourself and your partner to take that. And then just like everyone has a money language, have you heard of money languages before? Is everyone, do you think everyone's familiar with that? No. Explain oh, what's okay. a money language. There's five different money languages. You can Google it. It's pretty easy to, to find that material out there. And basically some people, their love language is acts of service. And if you do nice things for them, they see that as loving, right? Other people, their their love language is someone who buys gifts for them or someone else their love language might be touch or maybe spending quality time together. Everyone has a different version of their love language. And if you know what your partner's love language is and it's different to yours, you know what they need from you in order to feel loved. And you can also articulate to them what you need in or, because they might not understand that you need lots of touch, you need lots of hugs all the time, or maybe you need them, if you're an active service person, it means so much to you that they take out the garbage or they do what, you know, what they need to do in the house to support you. It's the same as that for money, right? So there's eight different money personality archetypes. And if you can understand which one you are, first of all, that will help you understand how you make financial decisions and also what your biggest challenges are. So what you need to address to be able to move to the next level. And then it's the same with your partner. If you understand what their money language is, you can talk in their language. So me personally, I'm an accumulator, which means I'm a hoarder of money, right? Which is quite appropriate for a, an accountant. But that actually, believe it or not, can be a bad thing. Because in the past, I used to hoard money so much that I wouldn't put it to work. I would just keep it, even though I know because I'm a financial advisor, I know that you're going to get a better return in the market, in the stock market, than keeping it in a bank account where the you know inflation is usually higher than the rate of interest that you're going to receive. So your money goes backwards. I know this, but for some reason, I, I always kept sabotaging and procrastinating on making those investments. And once I found out what my money archetype was, I could see that this is a major challenge for me and I need to force myself to let go of money, to let go of control so that because money's like the ocean and it needs to come in and out and you need to spend money to make money. You need to let it go to work. Money loves to work. It doesn't like to be hauled up in an ivory tower. It hates that, you know, whereas other people might be a romantic and like my sister's a romantic and she like loves to spend money. She loves, she loves to spend on experience so total opposite to me but no one archetype is better than another it's just mm. that you don't want to be a full extreme you want to be able to rein it in a little bit so my sister needed to have more of a long-term plan with a meaningful anchor emotional anchor like to buy a house so to speak which is you know she she ended up doing but once you know what this is and once you know what your partner's is you can talk on their level and you can talk about what matters to them 
So if your partner is a romantic, you can talk about the kind of experiences you're going to have five years in the future when you resist spending too much now because you've got this big goal of this big experience in the future, mm -hmm. right? Whereas if your partner is an accumulator, you might be helping them to feel comfortable and in control of their money by making sure their systems and making sure you've always got a certain amount in savings so that they feel comfortable and maybe a portion of it is invested. You know, that kind of thing. I'm going to go and do that quiz straight away. I tell you what, <laughs> I'll make sure that I pop the link to the quiz in the show notes so everyone can go and do it. I think that it is so valuable, like any sort of archetypal quiz. It really just gives you insight into the type of person that you are and allows you to acknowledge that and even yeah. accept it to a certain degree as well and find those points where you can improve or can do things perhaps a little bit differently in order to get to the goal that you want to get to. Now, we've spoken a little bit about surroundings, but let's just quickly touch on the mindset side of things. And you mentioned the, the the term money block a few times, and I think that most people generally know what a money block is, but can you describe what a block is yeah. and how, and perhaps how we can identify that we might actually have one as well? So if you don't have as much money in your bank account or in your portfolio as you want, you have a money block. It's as simple as that. It's really not that hard. But even billionaires have money blocks because by human nature, we always want to go to the next level. We're here to grow. We're not here to be stagnant, just like, you know, a tree is going to grow as much as it can, right? If you're not growing, you're dying. That's what the saying, how the saying goes. And so it's not about being like this, this greed or anything of going, I have to beat other people. And it's got nothing to do with that. It's got to do with other, as a human, just going to the next level all the time, right? The mindset side of the money blocks is that it all comes back to our childhood. When you're born, right? A newborn baby doesn't have any belief systems in place. They're a clean slate, right? They're just taking in information from their surroundings. And when they're hungry or they're not feeling comfortable, they will just cry, even if it's three o'clock in the morning. They don't care about upsetting you and they don't think to themselves, oh, I better not do that because mom's not going to like it. They just do what they want to do, right? So when, by the time we become sort of a teenager, we're very aware, we have our ego in place and we're very aware of what other people think of us and stuff like that. So the money blocks come from these learned behaviours that we take in in our first sort of 7 to 12 years of life of what's going on around us. And because we were a clean slate when we came out, it's literally imprinting into our software program of what we believe to be true. Right, We take it as a fact that, say, if you, you saw your parents working really hard, we take it as a fact that in order to make money, you have to work really hard. Money is tied to working hard because you have to literally question that. It's, it's mm. not true. Mm. I can think of plenty of examples of people out there in the world who make millions and millions of dollars every day not doing anything. For example, even your superannuation fund, you don't do anything for that money to, to grow and for income and dividends to come in in your superannuation fund. So it's totally possible to make money without effort. So that's a money block, right? That's just an example. And then so we all these money blocks, they, they might be really small ones and they just sort of stack on top of each other until you get to this point where you don't have what you want in terms of money or wealth and you're feeling stuck and you're feeling like hopeless, like there's no way out of this. This is just how it is. I'm just going to have to deal with this. I'm just going to have to keep working harder in my business. This is a money block. You have to, in all, you can't solve a problem from being in the problem. You have to get perspective. You have to get out of the problem. You have to acknowledge that this is all part of belief systems. They're not exactly necessarily true. How can I disprove these money blocks? Maybe do some brainstorming if you're in business on all the different ways you can bring in more money and just find examples of other people who are doing what you want to do with ease to remind yourself that it's totally possible to disprove all of these belief systems because they can be unlearned. And that's what you do with the power of mindset, with mantras, with just journaling, with surrounding yourself with positive imagery to reflect the goals that you're looking to receive. 
achieve, all of that kind of stuff. There's so many different things you can do. So from a very simplistic level, what I'm hearing, Julia, is there is a belief system that is ingrained in us. Once we can identify those, then to remove those blocks, we then need to find examples of ways we can disprove it. Yeah, disproving it is is the yeah. most effective way. And you'll probably have the same kind of block come up in a different version, like over and over again. So as you clear one block, it'll reappear to test you in another way, right? And so in order, you've just, this is why things like meditation is good because it really helps you to clear your mind so that you have that perspective. And you can literally, like I say to myself every day, I choose to see things differently. I choose to let go of limiting beliefs about money and wealth because even even though I'm working on this all the time, there's always another layer. Mm -hmm. And it's not to sort of disappoint you all and say, oh, this is never going to work. Of course it works, but it's all about this growing and it's about getting to that next level, next level, next level. And like I said, even billionaires have money blocks. It's just not as big a block. The world is full of opportunities and there's no limit to how much money there is in the world. It's all digital anyway. Only 5% of our currency exists in physical form. It's all just made up, you know? So Mm. it's not like they need to literally print more money because there's not really much physical money around there. It's all digital. And if you can imagine like the ocean, if you take a little bucket and let's say you get greedy and you want two or three buckets, is that going to deplete it for everyone else? No, because there's a limitless supply out there. And you having more does not mean someone has less. It's about changing these belief systems about what's triggering you and and maybe address these beliefs that you have that maybe rich people are bad or maybe or wealthy people are bad I should say and yeah. maybe address these situations like if you've got friends who are quite wealthy and they don't necessarily have any worries if that triggers you that's a money block because you if you're resenting someone who has money or judging them what makes you think your subconscious is going to let you be like them your subconscious is trying to protect you because it's like back in your five-year-old self it's seeing people like that as bad and it's saying, right, I've got to stay in my tribe and be like my family. So even though you're not aware of it, these subconscious beliefs, they're underneath and you need to bring them up to the surface and look at them and understand what's holding you back. And I think that we probably do need help, outside help to be able to do that as well, to be able to... Yeah, be able to see them. But Julia, you mentioned, you've talked a little bit about billionaires and having a lot of money. And I think that a lot of my listeners feel as though success isn't tied to being rich. Okay, so success for them probably means other things like being able to be there for family or being able to care for other people. So how how would you address this idea that we have money blocks just because we, we're we not rich? Yeah, well, like there's a couple of different things to address here. Yep. There's the difference between being rich and being wealthy. Mm-hmm. So rich is not what I'm talking about. Rich is people who like celebrities, sports stars, people who win the lottery, they get a lot of money very quickly. And because their identity is still the old version of themselves and hasn't caught up, that money just slips through their fingers because their belief system comes into play from when they're a child. And that's not normal for them to have that. So that's why you see celebrities, you know, five or 10 years down the track, they've gone through $10 million. And you're like, how can someone possibly go through that kind of Mm -hmm. money? because their belief systems underlying don't match being wealthy. So that's the difference. So rich is just spending what you earn and not worrying about the future. Wealthy is bringing in money, income, without effort, right? It's very different. It's like your superannuation fund when your money just makes money while you sleep, but like massively amplified. So if you, by having wealth in your life, 
it's not, it's never a bad thing, especially for women. The world needs more wealthy women because when you have wealth in your life, you have choices. You can spend your time how you like. That may well be with your friends and family and doing things that you love. You can also support activities and purposes that you that you love. You can spend money helping other people's businesses. You know, it's a very positive thing. So when someone says, in my business, it's not about the money, I do it because I love it. I'm like, but why can't it be about the money as well? Like, because if you make more money, you can help more people. You can maybe offer free stuff to people because you've already met your quotas. You can, you know, step into philanthropy and stuff like that. You're allowed to have more than you need. Where does this concept come into your life that I'm only, if I have more than enough, that means I'm a bad person or it means I'm putting money first. There is nothing wrong with having more than enough money. People always go back to this whole money is evil. But the original saying for that was the love of money is evil. So when you when you prioritize money above everything else, your health, your family, your value system, you know, that's different. But you're not going to we're not going to be like that. Money simply amplifies who you already are. And if you're a good person, which most of us are, especially women, because we're wired to nurture and to, and to collaborate and look after each other. When you amplify that, that's, that's good. There's nothing bad in that. I love that. And I think that that's probably such a beautiful way to end this conversation that money amplifies who you are. And I, I think that we could just talk about money mindset and blocks all day, but we have only got a certain amount of time, Julia. So I'm going to wrap it up here and ask you before we finish up though, I'm all about women not only using their superpowers, but owning them as well. So what would you say is your superpower? My superpower would be communication, I would say. Mm-hmm. I really love to help other people to understand complex financial structures and things like that. I help them understand how money makes money. And then more, the most importantly, important part is I help them understand where they might be blocking themselves in money. So I feel like that is my superpower or I, that's what I aspire to, to be my superpower because it's really important to me that the world has more wealthy women because women do money differently. We're wired differently nothing against men but like it's it's our turn you know to 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 step up and at least be level yeah Mm, beautiful words and do you have any final parting words of wisdom make sure you know what you want most women don't know what they want believe it or not in terms of money what is that amount is it more than enough if it's if it's not more than enough like double it 10 exit whatever it is and identify if that's triggering to you to 10x your current financial goal, then that's identifying a money block. Why do you think it's bad to have more money? What, because until you address that, your subconscious is never going to let you be wealthy. And let be, be if it feels like you being wealthy is going to mean that you lose friendships or your family might not get on with you, or maybe you're worried about people wanting money from you, address all of that. Because it's all, it's a beautiful thing. So write it down, set your goals, write it down and address your mindset. Amazing words of wisdom there. Thank you, Julia. And thank you so much for coming on the podcast today and sharing your wisdom with my listeners. I truly appreciate you being here. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure. I love to talk about this stuff. Thanks so much for listening. That's it for another week. To get more powerful content in your life, make sure you're following along on socials. My handle is at Meld Business. And just in case you're wondering, the groovy music for this podcast was created by Just Here on SoundCloud. I'd also be super grateful if you took a moment to rate and review this podcast so more amazing women like you can experience the power of content. And if you're like, hell Mel, stop talking. I'm ready to work with you now. Here's how we can work some powerful content magic together. Firstly, come and join the content effect, my membership inspiring women with service-based businesses to ditch the content chaos and start creating standout content that gets you noticed and makes sales. You can join us by using the link in the show notes or just Google the content effect. 
The second way we can work together is via my one-on-one -on -one packages. We can create a sustainable content strategy or start to build out your client journey. It's up to you. Pop on over to meldbusinessservices.com.au forward slash services to find out more. Until next time, have a beautiful week and embrace the power of your content.